like to welcome you here, and uh, before we get started, we'd like to tell you a little bit about the next dinner with the doctor, and uh, Kazia Finley will give us the word about what's going to be the next program, because she's going to be the, the giver of it. Not over 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you, Dr. O'Dell. Hello, everyone. My name is Kazia Finley, and I am a pharmacist. And I will be talking about the review of most commonly used herbal medications. We'll look at some of the medications like saw palmetto, ginkgo, maybe ginger, curcumin, turmeric. And we're going to look at the safety and the efficacy of these medications. And a little bit of review of how these are regulated by the government. And are they re regulated by the government? As well as drug-drug interactions. And what are some of the products that are available? There's so many brands out there. How do you select something? More and more people are trying to medicate themselves because of the cost of prescription medications or insurance. So some tips on how to safely use them and are they safe? So please come next time to hear this talk. Thank you. Kazia, I don't know how you're going to do that in 45 minutes, but uh, I mean, this, this is one big topic, and it's one that I personally struggle with in my practice because I don't know much about this stuff. And there's not, uh, it, if it's not uh, approved by the FDA, I don't know anything about it, the Federal Drug Administration. So tonight uh, we're going to talk about uh, metabolic problems, and that's what you eat and what it does to you. And I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Eric Bolowa to you, and then we'll have just a, a brief uh, devotional by uh, Pastor Jeremy, who is the uh, pastor of the Greenville Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, Dr. Bolowa is an associate of mine in the uh, Ballad Health, and he and his wife, Beth, who's a general surgeon, came here in 2013 from upstate New York. They decided they had to be a, a better place to live, and they found it, just like we did 55 years ago, because we're from up in that neck of the woods, too. Uh, and uh, he's eminently qualified to give us our talk tonight because uh, he is boarded in a lot of different things that have to do with metabolic, the, the obesity and lipidology, which is the study of uh, you know the cholesterol and, and the other blood fats and uh, then uh, lifestyle medicine. So he's, uh, he's really done a lot of things to be right on top of everything he's gonna talk about tonight. Uh, and he's board certified, actually he's board certified also in internal medicine and in uh, pediatrics, which I guess he's not doing much peds right now. But uh, uh, so we're delighted to have him here. And after uh, Jeremy has a few words, why we'll, he'll go ahead and present. Again, I want to welcome you this evening. Welcome to the Greenville Seventh-day Adventist Church. We uh, enjoy putting on these dinner with the doctors each quarter, and we're glad that you're here tonight. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord, you're a merciful and gracious God, and we're so thankful that you have given us life, that you've given us the joys that come with life, and that even in the midst of all the pain and suffering around us, that there's... Um, there's beauty that comes to us each day from the hand of our Creator. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to learn tonight, for the fellowship we've shared, for the good food we've enjoyed. Would you draw close to us tonight that we might <clears throat> learn and that we might um, become healthier individuals, that we might become a temple in which your Holy Spirit loves to dwell. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, uh, Jesus in John chapter 6 <clears throat> is recorded in feeding the 5,000, a miracle that you're no doubt familiar with. And in that parable, he says, um, after the feeding of the 5,000, I should say, it's not a parable, he, he goes on and he says in verse 35, and Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and in he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I, said, but I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, 
and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of the Father, who sent me, that of, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And then Jesus later says in verse 41, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is this, not, is this Jesus, the son of David, whose father and mother we know? How is it then he says, I have come down from heaven? And Jesus therefore answered and said to them, do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. Jesus compares himself to the bread of life. He is the bread of life. And we are told that, that those, who are, are, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness are blessed. I, I don't know about you, but there's times where you, you find yourself extremely hungry and even the aroma of something that maybe you didn't, wouldn't normally care for, but, but because you're so hungry, you would love even that. In the society today, we have so many um, fabricated foods, you know, foods that are just man-made, basically, and there's very little of the original in there, um, whether it's a French fry from McDonald's or, or what have you. And, and those smells are, are designed to, to, you know, cause us to sort of salivate and, and to desire. But you go down the aisle and you can see some of this fresh food in the produce aisle, and it may be colorful and pretty, but it, 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 you, you have to actually taste it sometimes to fully appreciate it, right? With Jesus, there is so much that Satan has put before us that has distracted us, that has suggested to us that this will make us happy, when all the while Jesus still offers the, the bread of life, the, 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 the sustenance that will really bring us the fulfillment that the body needs. And much like the French fries, if you will, from McDonald's, uh, uh, the, the sin of this world, the things of this world, that you wouldn't necessarily, uh, you, you find it attractive. Let's just be honest. It, it, it might be the entertainment that the world offers up, or it, it might be the diet that the world offers up. But, but it's so easily to be seduced by those things because of the smell, because of the, the, what everybody else is doing. Uh, the temptations that exist and surround that particular want. But all the while, Jesus is beckoning you, beckoning me. I am the bread of life. You could eat these empty things that the world offers, and, and you have to eat a lot, and you eat it, and then no time later, you're hungry again. Why? Because it's essentially like empty calories, right? I mean, you're eating something, and it's not nur nurturing your body. It's just giving you some calories. And that's the way sin is. It, it doesn't, it's hollow inside. It's, it's like those, you know, those, those things that are sort of puffy, and they just, like cotton candy. You put it in your mouth, and it disappears, right? But with Jesus... Take the, the bread of life and study the word and, and allow him to feed you each morning. And you find that you have something that sticks with you through the day. Amen? It, 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 it satisfies the soul. It, it gives you hope when the world is hopeless. It, it, it gives you love when nobody else seems to, to care. It, it gives you something that sticks with you. When Jesus comes in the clouds of glory, if you have nourished yourself with the Word of God, if you've basked in His presence and allowed Him to awaken those hunger, that hunger to, to change your taste buds, so to speak. And I'm not, I'm not just talking about physical food, you understand. I'm talking about having our taste, our desires changed so that they're fashioned and molded after His likeness. If we receive the new covenant, you know that what that is, right? It's, it's in Hebrews chapter 8. It tells us that he, he, changes, he writes his law in our hearts. That means he changes what you desire. And what you once hated, now you love. And what you once loved, you now hate. That's the miracle of the gospel. And that is something that only Jesus can do. 
And just to let you out on a secret, if you'll let him do that for you, it won't just change the spiritual desires of your heart, but he'll actually change the physical taste that you desire when you sit at the table. It's a miracle, and it's something we need Jesus to do in us. So we can read, we can listen, but until you have Jesus, you'll find yourself going in a circle just like that hamster in the wheel. Let us pray. Lord, we need you to satisfy. We need the bread of heaven. And like the manna fell each morning, we pray that you would help us to come and to receive the word afresh each morning when we awaken, that we might find the nourishment, the, the direction, the, the DNA that we need to go through that day. Lord, we need you to change our tastes. We need you to change our desires. We need you to change what we have loved of this world and to make it hateful to us so that what we once hated, we will now love. We need you. So feed us with the manna of heaven. Feed us with your presence, and may we study to show ourselves approved that we will receive the grace from heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, thank you, Dr. Odell, for the kind introduction. Um, and Jeremy, thank you for that devotional, which kind of applies to something we we're going to talk about today. Um, I'd like to thank Steve for his audiovisual support, um, Rhoda Khanna for the, arranging the logistics in this lecture, and Dr. Arvo Khanna that asked me to speak at tonight's venue. And I'd like to thank the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church for the lovely meal, um, the venue, which I think God we can get together again like this, and uh, the air conditioning. <coughs> <laughs> um, I chose tonight's topic on chronic metabolic disease um, and obesity, and I want you to think of those in one bubble, uh, not because I see it all day long in my clinic, uh, but, but it affects so many Americans. Nearly 70% of Americans have at least one chronic metabolic disease, and that's a lot of illness, morbidity, and mortality. What I'm hoping to do tonight is to weave together a scientific story linking certain macronutrients to today's chronic metabolic disease and obesity pandemic. They give it as one bubble. And yes, there will be some science involved, and you'll hear scary terms like metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, adiposopathy, biochemistry, but I'll make it easier for you to understand. Because if you don't understand the science behind your disease, you're going to find it very difficult to treat as a clinician or as a patient. Now, I'm sure some of you are wondering what a chronic metabolic disease is and, and who is Hippocrates, but I'll get to that in a second. But I want to give you an overview of what tonight's lecture is going to be about. Um, I'll take you through my certification journey in trying to understand <clears throat> chronic metabolic disease and how lifestyle is affected. We'll spend a little time on Hippocrates. Um, we'll list the chronic metabolic diseases. We'll discuss the relationship of insulin, metabolic syndrome, and obesity. We'll explore the unusual science that a calorie is not a calorie inside the body and how that biochemistry is abnormal with lipids, proteins, and carbohydrates causing chronic metabolic disease. We'll go over nine clinical studies trying to use intensive lifestyle intervention to reverse chronic metabolic disease. I'll touch a little bit about the Metabolic Weight Management and Lifestyle Center. We'll do a case presentation utilizing intensive lifestyle intervention to see if any of this works. And of course, I'll answer the question at the end of the lecture, what would Hippocrates do to treat chronic metabolic disease in the 21st century? I'm the medical director of the Metabolic Weight Management Lifestyle Center that opened its doors in 2014, thanks to the efforts of Daniel Wolcott, Lyndon Gallimore, Ginger Johnson, and Craig Quillen. Many thanks to them. My first two board certifications were in internal medicine and pediatrics back in 1988 to 1992. <clears throat> and those certifications prepared me to manage 
chronic metabolic disease and obesity. We would screen for the diagnosis, we would offer them the latest pill that they eventually couldn't afford, and over the next 20 years, up into 2013, all of my patients became heavier and more sick. Something was horribly wrong. I had to be a better physician than that. I didn't go to all that schooling for not to help my patients get better. So 2013 was a watershed year. That was the year we moved from New York to Tennessee. That's the year that trans fatty acids was taken off the market. And that's the year that obesity was designated a disease. Think of obesity and chronic metabolic disease in the same bubble. And that's when my medical renaissance began. And over the next six years, from 2014 and on, I obtained four additional board certifications and a lifestyle coach certification for the sole purpose of trying to understand chronic metabolic disease and obesity at a higher level. Sort of my academic midlife crisis. Probably safer than a girlfriend or a fast motorcycle. I became boarded in obesity medicine in 2014. This group of people, they love fats and hate carbs. I became boarded in, in clinical epidemiology 2017. This people loves carbs and hates fats. I became a physician nutrition specialist 2019. This group of people loves high protein diets. And I became a lifestyle medicine boarded physician in 2020. This group of people love plant based diets and balance between uh, eating, exercise, nutrition, stress, sleep hygiene. And I became a lifestyle coach in uh, 2020, February 2020. Uh, and this organization takes people who are ambivalent to change and tries to move them toward actionable change. And then in March 2020, everything shut down, the whole world shut down. Uh, so I had to stop getting boards. Uh, the, uh, in my early training, we were taught to manage chronic metabolic disease and obesity. With these additional certifications over the last six years, I've come to understand the science of obesity and chronic metabolic disease, which offer more treatment options as far as nutrition, lifestyle, and pharmacotherapy that markedly improve, if not reverse, chronic metabolic disease. Patients getting thinner and healthier, patients taking back control of their health. As I promised, here's the first slide on Hippocrates. He's known as the father of medicine. He was a Greek physician 2,500 years ago. He is thought to be the source of the Hippocratic Oath, which is the first expression of medical ethics. Above all, do no harm. And this oath is taken to all graduating medical students still to this day. He, is, he was a big enough a deal that he was mentioned in the writings of contemporaries Plato and Aristotle. He developed Hippocratic medicine, which emphasized prognosis, compassion, and professionalism, core elements that are still being taught and practiced today. And he believed that disease was caused naturally, not by gods or superstitions. And more of this Hippocrates at the end of the lecture. As I promised, this lists the chronic metabolic diseases we're talking about, linking obesity and chronic metabolic disease in the same bubble. These are the major ones, and they account for 75% of all health care costs in this country per year. That's over a trillion dollars. We have diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, which is high cholesterol, high triglycerides, and low good cholesterol. We have cardiovascular disease, which is peripheral vascular disease, stroke, and heart attack. Fatty liver, uh, polycystic ovarian disease, dementia, overweight and obesity, and obesity-related cancers that are listed here. In my early training, we thought these to be separate, distinct diseases with unique pathophysiologies. 10%, 90% genetic, and 10% lifestyle. It was your destiny. It was inevitable. It was your time to get it. With these additional certifications over the last six years, I've come to realize there's a common thread. They run together. There's a core phenomenon. 10% genetic and 90% lifestyle. Maybe it's not your time. Maybe it's not your destiny. Maybe it's not inevitable. This lists the chronic metabolic diseases um, and their prevalence. Um, there's US data on the left. There's global data on the right. We're talking about 8 billion global data, 330 million U.S. data, and 260 million adults uh, in the U.S., and that's what these are based on on this side of the slide. 108 million people with hypertension, 98 million with hypercholesterolemia, 85 million hypertriglyceridemia, 34 million diabetics, and 100 million prediabetics, 18 million cardiovascular disease, 6 million Alzheimer's, 5 million polycystic ovarian disease, 108 million people with obesity. You combine overweight and obesity, 190 million people. 
There's not that many people left that are with normal weights. Metabolic syndrome, 130 to 150 million people. Fatty liver, up to 100 million people. Now, this is not a chronic metabolic disease, but I threw it in for a purpose. Chronic metabolic disease has way more morbidity and mortality than COVID-19. But you've heard crickets from the powers that be regarding that issue. You remember the intensity over the past two years and all the efforts that was made to treat this COVID-19 virus. If that effort could have been put into chronic metabolic disease, just imagine how many people's lives would have been affected and would have been saved. This slide uh, shows the prevalence of obesity from 1960 to 2030 projected in U.S. adults. When I was born, obesity was 10%. When I was in college, it was 13%. When I was in residency, it was 20%. When I moved to Tennessee, it was 36%. It's currently 42% on its way to 50% by 2030. That's a lot of disease burden. This slide shows you the prevalence of obesity in both adults and kids from 1999 to 2016. Adults are in the blue at the top, kids are at the bottom in the green. In the 1960s, pediatric obesity was only 4.6%. By 2000, it was 14%. By 2016, 18%, and it's currently about 20%, one-fifth of the pediatric population. This slide tells us that both adults and kids are getting heavier together, meaning there's something seriously wrong with our environment. <clears throat> In my early training, obesity was never thought of as a disease. It was a choice. It was a lifestyle. Eating too much, exercising too little, sloth, gluttony, laziness. But that all came to an end June 21, 2013, when the American Medical Association House of Delegates finally designated obesity as a disease in the same way they did diabetes, high blood pressure, and depression. And the rationale was, the suggestion that obesity was not a disease, but rather a consequence of a chosen lifestyle, exemplified by overeating or inactivity, was equivalent to suggesting that lung cancer is not a disease because it was brought about by an individual's choice to smoke cigarettes. This had several implications. We were hoping that medical schools would start teaching the pathophysiology and treatment of obesity. That's not happening. We were hoping that it, society would reduce its stigma on excess weight, no weight bias. Think of obesity as more like an addiction or mental health problem or alcoholism. Stop blaming the patient. That's not happening so much. We we're hoping that insurance companies would reimburse doctors for treating obesity. If you can't mention that diagnosis, you're not getting reimbursed. We we're hoping that more research funding would go in to develop therapies and pharmacologies to help treat obesity. And that is happening at the cost of $1,500 a month. No one can afford it. I was in practice for 20 years before this was even designated a disease. So that allows me to offer some perspective on the treatment dilemma of chronic metabolic disease and obesity by telling you a story from my past. I've been practicing long enough to give you perspective. Let me flash back to June 5th, 1981. That was the day that the first case of HIV AIDS was diagnosed. I was just in college at that time and there was no treatment. 1984, got into medical school, still no treatment. 1987, 88, that was the first drug came out, was Zidovudine, AZT, to help treat HIV AIDS. And I just started residency at that time, and I was greeted with a whole ward of HIV AIDS patients wasting away by opportunistic infections toward their deaths, because we didn't have a lot of good treatment. Flash forward 35 years, and we have great medicines to suppress viral replication to undetectable levels where many patients can live with HIV AIDS as a chronic illness. Obesity is a recent disease too, nine years ago. And we don't have a lot of good treatment for that now. Do I have to wait 35 years for the magic bullet treatment? This presentation will show you that we have treatments at our fingertips right now that can markedly improve and reverse chronic metabolic disease and obesity. I have to do this, I'm obligated. <clears throat> this is the definition, textbook definition of obesity. It is a chronic multifactorial neurobehavioral disease where an increase in body fat promotes adipose tissue dysfunction, a term called adiposopathy, sick fat, visceral fat, fat on fire, inflammation of fat, and abnormal fat mass physical forces resulting in adverse metabolic and biomechanical psychosocial health consequences. That is the definition of a word salad. 
So I'm going to break it down and make it a little easier for you to understand. Chronic, it's not curable. Once you get it, it never goes away. You may put it into remission, you may be able to treat it, but it always wants to come back. When you develop too much fat tissue on your body, it becomes inflamed. Adiposopathy is the term. That inflammation produces those chronic metabolic diseases that we talked about a couple slides ago. Obesity, chronic metabolic disease, same bubble. Physical force, when you develop too much weight on your body, you develop physical force-related diseases. Sleep apnea, urinary incontinence, reflux disease, osteoarthritis. Fat is the very tissue that saved early man is now killing us. Obesity causes 65 different diseases. You've got to think of it as one thing. This is the slide that lists all the, all the diseases caused by obesity. And, and we're very good at, at, at diagnosing them as practitioners individually. We can treat them and diagnose them individually. Whether that be AFib or heart failure, whether it be leg edema, sleep apnea, reflux disease, um, skin tags, venous stasis dermatitis, osteoarthritis, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, urine incontinence, or obesity-related cancers, but never once thought that there may be a common thread, a core mechanism that they may run together. If abnormal lifestyles and obesity causes all these diseases, it stands to reason that improving one's lifestyle and lowering your weight can reverse all these diseases. This slide helps us focus on the macronutrient that is most responsible for today's chronic metabolic disease and obesity pandemic. This shows us how our food dollars have been reallocated between the years 1982 to 2012. Back in the late 70s, our government determined that fat was the devil's own, the cause of all of our ills, that it made you fat, diabetic, sick, inflammatory, caused heart attacks and strokes, partially right. And they recommended reducing our fat intake from 40% to 30%, and as good U.S. citizens, we obeyed. Our meats went from 31% down to 21%, 31% decrease. Our dairy went from 13% down to 10%, 20% decrease. And our fruits and vegetables, whole grains and beverages, those numbers all stayed about the same over 30 years. And you can tell by those recommendations that our society has become more healthy and fit because of those recommendations, right? Not. We're more unhealthy and more unfit than ever before. The one food group that has more than doubled and continues to increase is refined processed carbohydrates, starchy sugars, and artificial sweeteners that causes overweight, obesity, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, and chronic metabolic disease. That's where we need to focus. All right, so a lot of you may not know about this metabolic syndrome. What is this thing all about? What is this insulin resistance? Well, I'm going to make it easy for you to understand. Let's, these are the markers of metabolic syndrome. Let's see if anybody has that. Increased waist circumference. Elevated blood sugar, elevated blood pressure, low good cholesterol, and elevated triglycerides. I'm sure somebody out there in the audience has these things. If you have any three out of the five of those markers, you have metabolic syndrome, and you can pretty much guarantee that your insulin levels are way too high. And that's bad, and we'll get to that. And when you have metabolic syndrome, it increases your risk of stroke and heart attack by threefold. But let's look at these markers a little bit more closely and see if it reminds you of anything that we've already discussed. What is increased waist circumference but overweight and obesity? Chronic metabolic disease. What is elevated blood sugar but prediabetes and diabetes? Elevated, it's chronic metabolic disease. What is elevated blood pressure? Chronic metabolic disease. What is low good cholesterol and elevated triglyceride? Dyslipidemia, chronic metabolic disease. What is stroke and heart attack? Chronic metabolic disease. Metabolic syndrome is a screening tool for chronic metabolic disease. It is a predictor of what you're going to get. And you're going to get all those diseases. If you have this now, you're going to have all those diseases later on. You will observe that cholesterol is no way part of this criteria. But we know cholesterol is bad, right? Why is that being left out? It's sad. Cholesterol is a different health problem. People who have high cholesterolemia have an insensitivity and intolerance to saturated fatty acids found in tropical oils, animal meats, uh, dairy, eggs. But people with metabolic syndrome have an intolerance to refined processed carbohydrate, starchy sugars, and artificial sweeteners that causes the me chronic metabolic disease. 
So who has metabolic syndrome? This slide is from 2004, when obesity was only 30%, when adult population was only 240 million people. But the ratios still hold up. 80% of the obese have metabolic syndrome. So those are the ones that are having all the disease, but not so. 40% of overweight, normal weight patients have metabolic syndrome for a grand total of 124 million people who have metabolic syndrome, who are going to have chronic metabolic disease, morbidity, and mortality. It's a predictor. Now, if I substitute 42%, which is today's obesity rate, and 260 million in adults, that number approaches 150 million. That's half the U.S. population. That means half of you out there may have metabolic syndrome. What's this deal about insulin? I thought that was just a hormone that lowers blood sugar. That is true, but it does so much more. And it is tied to the metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance. These have high insulin levels. So it does lower blood sugar, but did you know it's a growth hormone? I didn't know that as a medical student. I didn't know that as a resident. I didn't know that until 2014. And I'm a doctor. It makes things bigger. It grows protein, it grows glycogen, it grows fat. Higher levels make you bigger. I'll give you an example. Infants are diabetic mothers. Mothers have high blood sugar, therefore they give that to the baby. They have high blood sugar. Baby makes high insulin levels, they come out 10 pounders, they need C-sections. If I start insulin on any patient of mine, they're gonna gain 10 to 20 pounds a year because it's a growth hormone. That's what it's supposed to do. At the same time it's growing all this stuff, it takes all the extra starch and sugar in your body and creates fat from it. So eating too many potatoes or bread or rice or cereal, more than the body can use, it's gonna turn it into fat. So at the same time it's building everything, it's turning off fat burning. Insulin turns off fat burning. You can't lose weight with high insulin levels. It's like pouring water on a campfire. It absorbs water and sodium from the kidney, so all these patients have swollen legs and they're waterlogged. And, the, and insulin interferes with neurotransmitters in the brain, making you more hungry than you should be. So what food makes insulin go up? Is it fat? No. Protein, tiny bit. Refined processed carbohydrates, starch or sugars, and artificial sweeteners, the thing that we have doubled over the past 35 years and continues to increase, that's what causes it. So insulin is a building hormone. It builds things, especially fat. <clears throat> but there are hormones in the body that try to work against insulin, try to create a balance. These are called counter-regulatory hormones. They try to break down fat, break down muscle, break down carbohydrates and glycogen. And they're listed here on the left side of the slide. You would think that eight of these hormones could battle one little insulin molecule. Well, I want you to think of the insulin molecule as the Marvel superhero, the Hulk. Nobody beats the Hulk. One meal that spikes your insulin levels too high, you're going to turn off your fat burning for three days. This slide will help convey the property of insulin as a growth hormone. Let me draw your attention to the boy on the left side of the slide. You could tell he's thin, cachectic, emaciated, malnourished, no muscle, no fat, skin, and bone. He's eating six meals a day, and he can't gain an ounce. He has type 1 diabetes. What is that type of diabetes? That's the diabetes where the pancreas does not make any insulin. So their blood sugars are very high, right? High insulin levels. Insulin level zero can't gain weight either. Point being, no insulin, no weight. Start to him on insulin, and four months later, this is the same boy. Normal muscle, normal fat, normal weight, normal insulin levels, normal blood sugar, eating three meals a day. No insulin, no weight, the right amount of insulin, the right amount of weight. Let's do it one more time. This slide will also show the property of insulin as a growth hormone. Let me draw your attention to the girl on the left side of the slide. You can tell she's thin, cachectic, emaciated, malnourished, skin and bone, no muscle, no fat. She also was eating six meals a day and can't gain an ounce. She has type 1 diabetes mellitus and her pancreas does not make any insulin. No, her blood sugar is high, no insulin, also she can't gain weight. No insulin, no weight. Start this person on insulin and four months later she's back to normal. Normal weight, normal muscle, normal fat, normal insulin levels, normal blood sugar, eating three meals a day, half the food, and can gain weight. No insulin, no weight, the right amount of insulin, the right amount of weight. The previous two slides showed you that no insulin or low insulin gives you no weight. This is the opposite. This person has what we talked about, metabolic syndrome, fatty belly, 
obesity, type 2 diabetes mellitus. Now, that's different than type 1 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes, we call insulin-resistant diabetes. You make enough insulin, you make a whole bunch of insulin, but it doesn't work very well to control your blood sugar, but it does a great job in all the other properties that we talked about. It's a growth hormone. More muscle, more fat. It's taking all the extra starch and sugar in your diet and turning it into fat right there in the belly. High levels are turning off your fat burning, so there's no way this guy can lose weight at all. It's absorbing water and sodium at the kidney, so your legs are always swollen, and it's interfering with neurotransmitters in the brain, making him more hungry than he should be. He shouldn't be hungry, but he is all the time. Point being, no insulin, no weight. The right amount of insulin, the right amount of weight. Too much insulin, like in the metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, too much weight. The statement that a calorie is a calorie, now we're getting to the, I'm sorry, the sciency part of the lecture. The statement that a calorie is a calorie is the notion that all calories have the same effect on the body. That 500 calories of broccoli and 500 calories of ice cream have the same metabolic destinies. It's just fuel. If that's true, get rid of the broccoli, give me the ice cream, but it's not true. That notion back in the 70s led to the recommendation to produce, to, to remove fat from the diet because that had the most calories per gram. If it's all based on calories, they get rid of the one that's most concentrated. Fat has nine calories per gram where carbohydrates and proteins have four calories a gram, twice the amount. Thus was born the low-calorie diet and the low-fat diet. And you can see that that really hasn't worked since we're getting sicker year after year. And you also remember that we have reduced our fat and protein diet by the previous graph. We have decreased that over 30, 30 35 years. But the one food group that has increased 100% and continues to increase is the refined processed carbohydrate, starches, sugars, and artificial sweeteners that produce hyperinsulinemia across the population. And that's not good. So food is not just fuel. It communicates with other systems in the body. It neurotransmitters in the brain, gastrointestinal system, endocrine system, even your DNA. I'm going to show you the metabolism of different macronutrients to show that they have different destinies within the body. Thus affirming that a calorie is not a calorie in the body. Empty calories if what the pastor was talking about. By doing so, by going through that exercise, I'll be able to identify the macronutrient responsible for today's chronic metabolic disease and obesity pandemic. And I'm sure you're interested in that. This table, we're going to start with fats, okay? This table lists dietary fats and their value in descending order to human health. Another way of saying it, good fats on the top, bad fats on the bottom. Omega-3 fatty acids found in wild fish and flaxseed oil, good anti-inflammatory effect, lowers triglycerides. Monounsaturated fats found in olive, olives, nuts, and canola oil, Mediterranean diet, good for liver metabolism and reduces atherogenesis. Polyunsaturated fats found in vegetable oils, corn, soybean, sunflower, good anti-inflammatory effect, lowers bad cholesterol, but also lowers good cholesterol. Saturated fatty acids found in uh, tropical oils and animal meats and dairy, uh, eggs, um, that produces higher LDL levels, but also it produces higher good cholesterol, too. Omega-6 fatty acids are found in starch-fed animals and fish, uh, grain-fed, and that's not so good, and that produces some atherosclerosis and insulin resistance. But the worst of them all was trans fatty acids that I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture. That's a synthetic fatty acid that was created from a polyunsaturated fa fatty acid to mimic a saturated fatty acid like butter. They wanted a vegetable oil to mimic butter. And they succeeded in that, and that was added to many of those food products that lasted on the shelves for an eternity. And the reason was is that bacteria could not break down trans fatty acids. Well, if bacteria can't break it down, neither can our mitochondria, and it accumulates in the liver causing fatty liver, insulin resistance, and chronic metabolic disease. The point I want to make, all of these are nine calories per gram, but you can see they have different metabolic destinies within the body, affirming that all calories are not the same, that different calories have different metabolic destinies. And some of them have pathologic metabolism causing illness and disease. Let me simplify it for you a little bit more. 
Trans fatty acid had no necessary biologic function in the body. Nothing could break it down. So it's always processed by the liver. The liver turns it into fat. Too much fat causes adiposopathy, causes inflammation, causes metabolic syndrome, causes metabolic disease, causes hepatic insulin resistance, and your insulin levels go high. This is a food product causing metabolic syndrome, chronic metabolic disease. And there's more of them. Don't get nervous. I'm going to make it easy for you to understand. Okay? This is amino acids. There's 20 amino acids in the body, nine of which are essential. That means we can't synthesize them. We have to consume them in our diet or we become ill. And we're going to focus on three of the nine essential amino acids called branched-chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And these are found in higher concentrations in starch-fed animals, grain-fed animals versus grass-fed animals. If those amino acids aren't assimilated into protein biosynthesis or cell growth, it's all sent to the liver for metabolism because it can't hang out in the bloodstream. It's toxic. And look what happens to the liver. And see if it, you recall any of this and it doesn't remind you of anything. Gluconeogenesis is liver sugar production, elevated blood sugars, diabetes, elevated blood pressure, hypertension, liver inflammation causing insulin resistance to the liver, high insulin levels. It turns into fat, fatty acids, that tur turns into lipid drop, if there's your fatty liver, Pack is a triglyceride, there's your overweight obesity, there's your dyslipidemia of high triglycerides, low HDL. Here's another food that causes metabolic syndrome in the body. Don't eat too much starch-fed animals. Now, my medical students have to know this slide in detail, but for you, I made it a little simple. Made it simpler and easier to understand. You take in too many branched chain amino acids, the liver's a one-trick pony. It turns it into fat for storage to get out of the system. Too much fat causes adiposopathy, adiposopathy, inflammation, inflammation, metabolic syndrome, and chronic metabolic disease. It also causes fatty liver, insulin resistance, insulin levels are high. Another food stuff, trans fatty acids does it, branched chain amino acids does it, metabolic syndrome. Let's go on to carbohydrates. Just bear with me. Glucose is the most friendly of our carbohydrates. It's in, our, it's in pasta and rice, potatoes, biscuits and gravy. Um, and it's utilized by every cell in the body and every cell on the planet to a point. Once the, once, the, once the tanks are filled in the brain and the muscles, anything extra has to be sent to the liver. Now, the liver can store some of it as glycogen, which, but there's, those tanks are a little bit small. Most of it goes to fatty acids and stored as a fat in the body. So too much starch, the, the liver's going to create fat and you're going to keep getting heavier and heavier, building more fat tissue. Now, my medical students have to know this slide in detail, but you, for you, I made it a little easier to understand. You take in too much glucose, more than the body can use, more than your muscles and brain can use, it has to be sent to the liver for processing. Once the glycogen storage tanks are filled up, the liver's a one-trick pony, it creates it into fat. Too much fat causes adiposopathy, inflammation, metabolic syndrome, chronic metabolic disease. And how do we measure sugar levels in the body, glucose levels, hemoglobin A1C? And if you have too high a level of sugar in your body, you have diabetes, right? So glucose is safe to a point, but it can cause metabolic syndrome. That's the most friendly one. Ethanol. Now, nobody drinks in here, I'm sure, okay? But some people do. And if you take in moonshine, you know, a little bit can be metabolized in the brain, but there's really no necessary biologic function of ethanol in the body, so the, the body has to remove it as a toxin. Here's what happens. It comes in, it causes inflammation. There goes the hepatic insulin resistance, and there go insulin levels go up. It causes hypertension. It turns into fatty acid and causes lipid droplets. There's your fatty liver. Pack is into a triglyceride. There's your overweight and obesity. Triglycerides in the blood. High triglyceride, low HDL, dyslipidemia. Here's another food stuff that is toxic to the body that's not the same as other foods and causes illness and disease. But let me make it a little easier for you to understand. Ethanol, like trans fatty acids, has no necessary biologic function in the body. It has to be removed as a, by the liver as a toxin. And the liver's a one-trick pony, so it creates fat out of it. Too much fat, adiposopathy, inflammation, metabolic syndrome, chronic metabolic disease. Causes, also causes fatty liver and cirrhosis and hepatic insulin resistance. Insulin levels are high. And you don't like high insulin levels. Another food stuff causing metabolic syndrome. But I did all that so I can have a, 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 a special one right here. This is fructose. Fructose is found in a sugar molecule. It's one half of a sugar molecule. It's found in sugar and in honey 
and uh, it's found in high fructose corn syrup. You know, you add it to your Mountain Dews, your sweet teas, your little Debbie cakes, and thousands of foods that are on our shelves to make them more palatable. But will you believe this? Like alcohol and like trans fatty acids, there's no necessary biologic function of fructose in the body, and it has to be removed by the liver as a toxin. It causes the increased gluconeogenesis, which elevates your blood sugar and causes diabetes. It causes elevation in blood pressure, hypertension. It elevates your uric acid levels. I thought uric acid was just red meats, wine, and cheese. That's what I was taught as a medical student, but it's also sugar. It causes inflammation of the liver, causes hepatic insulin resistance, insulin levels go high, it's processed to a fatty acid, there's your fatty liver. There's your triglycerides, there's your obesity. And there's your triglycerides, your dyslipidemia. Another food stuff that causes metabolic syndrome. And why is that important? Because this is the food that has been increasing over the past 35 years, over 100%, and continues to increase. This is the toxin. So let me make it easier for you to understand. Fructose has no necessary biologic function in the body, so it has to be removed as a toxin, just like trans fatty acids and alcohol. The liver, one trick pony, creates a fat out of it. Too much fat causes inflammation, adiposopathy, metabolic syndrome, chronic metabolic disease, hepatic insulin resistance, high insulin levels. There's your disease process. The liver can handle about six teaspoons of sugar a day. After that, it's pathological metabolism. It also causes fatty liver and cirrhosis. Matter of fact, that's taken over the number one spot as causing fatty liver and cirrhosis in America away from hepatitis C and from alcohol. My last, the last six years of certifications produced um, a deeper understanding of advanced lipidology for our clinic, which allows us to identify the macronutrient in a patient's diet to reverse to improve their metabolic derangement. The last six years of certifications allowed a deeper understanding of abnormal nutritional biochemistry of protein, carbohydrates, and fat that allows our clinic to identify the macronutrient that causes the patient's metabolic derangement that we can reverse by removing the abnormal nutrient. These are the academic areas that you need to know to treat chronic metabolic disease in the 21st century. Nutritional biochemistry, nutrient partitioning, advanced lipidology, de novo lipogenesis, translational lipoprotein biochemistry, gastrointestinal chronology, neurochemistry, eating disorders, leptin resistance, it goes on and on and on. The last six years of certifications produced these areas of academic advancement that allows our clinic to treat chronic metabolic disease more effectively in the 21st century. None of this was around 38 years ago when I started medical school. This is the summary slide of the, of the science part of the lecture. It puts it all together for you. You recognize the metabolic diseases that we discussed before. You saw the association of metabolic syndrome and liver dysfunction causing these diseases. And you saw that all those food products at the top of the pyramid were the culprits. Well, trans fatty acids, that's removed from the market. That's not our problem. Alcohol, not everybody drinks, so that can't be the problem. We're eating less protein and fat than we did 35 years ago. That can't be the problem. But the one food group that has more than doubled and continues to increase is refined processed carbohydrates, starchy sugars, and artificial sweeteners that are incompatible with our nutritional biochemistry, causing liver dysfunction, causing metabolic syndrome, causing chronic metabolic disease and obesity. There's your cause, there's your effect. Remember the metabolic syndrome, the science part of the lecture. And we know that all of our treatments that we've been giving patients for 35 years have not worked. Everybody's getting sicker and heavier. So is there something we can do to treat it that we haven't done before? The next, uh, I'm going to show you nine studies that use intensive lifestyle intervention to attempt to reverse chronic metabolic disease. So I'm going to use a term that you've heard too, too often in the past two years. Let's follow the science. You know that, right? Uh, first, first study by Ornish asked the question, can intensive lifestyle intervention treat coronary artery disease blockages better than usual care? So what he did, he took, he took oh my God, he took 48 patients, uh, divided into two groups. 
One was usual care, which got aspirin, beta blockers, and statins, and the other one got a plant-based diet, exercise, smoking cessation, stress management, and psychosocial support, the definition of intensive lifestyle intervention. After five years, the lifestyle group had an 8% decrease in all their blockages, where the control group had a 27% increase in all blockages. The lifestyle group had 25 bad cardiac events, where the control group had 45 bad cardiac events. The experimental group had progressive improvement, the control group progressive worsening, experimental group had 82% had some regression of their coronary artery disease. This study shows that intensive lifestyle intervention was more effective than usual care in treating coronary artery disease blockages, affirming that lifestyle changes can improve, if not reverse, chronic metabolic disease. Next study by Jenkins asked the question, can dietary lifestyle changes lower cholesterol as good as a statin can? He took 46 subjects, divided into three groups. Low-fat group, low-fat group plus lovastatin, and then the intensive lifestyle group with a portfolio diet of plant sterols, soy protein, viscous fibers, and almonds. After one month, he remeasured the bad cholesterol. The control group that just was on a low-fat diet had an 8% decrease. The statin plus low-fat diet, 30% decrease. And the portfolio lifestyle diet had a 29% decrease. And these two were not different statistically. This study shows that Dietary lifestyle changes can lower cholesterol as effective as statin medication, affirming that lifestyle changes can reverse and improve chronic metabolic disease. Next study by Nowler asked the question, can you prevent pre-diabetics from developing diabetes? He took 3,200 people, divided them into three groups. One group got a placebo pill, one got metformin, which is the standard treatment that we've been giving pre-diabetics for 35 years. And then the lifestyle group had weight loss of 7% and 150 minutes of exercise per week. And after three years, the placebo group, only 11% became diabetic. Metformin group, less than 8% became diabetic. But the lifestyle group, less than 5% became diabetic. This study shows that the lifestyle group was the most effective in preventing pre-diabetics from developing diabetes, affirming that Lifestyle changes can improve, if not reverse, chronic metabolic disease. This is a good one. Next study by Ornish asked the question, can you lower the growth and aggressiveness of prostate cancer by lifestyle changes? He took 30 men with biopsy-proven prostate cancer. He put them all on a plant-based diet with stress management, exercise, support sessions, and some supplements. And he re-biopsied the prostate cancer three months later. And what he found was that the DNA and genes of the prostate cancer were down-regulated for growth and aggressiveness. Not cured, but down-regulated. This study affirms that intensive lifestyle intervention can lessen the growth and aggressiveness of prostate cancer, affirming that lifestyle changes can improve, if not reverse, chronic metabolic disease. Next study by Lim asked the question, can intensive lifestyle intervention through low-calorie diet improve the parameters of diabetes mellitus? And the parameters they were looking at was liver sugar production, pancreatic function, and triglyceride levels. And it was the eight-week study. At the end of the eight weeks, the sugars went down from 166 to 106, liver sugar production decreased, liver and pancreatic triglycerides decreased, and pancreatic function improved. Another study showing that intensive lifestyle intervention through dietary restriction can improve parameters of diabetes mellitus affirming that lifestyle change can improve, if not reverse, chronic metabolic disease. Next study by Hambrecht asked the question, can exercise-intensive lifestyle intervention treat coronary artery disease better than angioplasty and stents? This is a big one. Took 100 patients, divided into two groups. Half had to exercise 20 minutes a day on a bicycle at 70% of maximum predicted heart rate, moderate to vigorous intensity, versus an angioplasty and stent group. At the end of the 12-month of the study, the exercise group spent half the money that the uh, angioplasty group did, but the exercise group had more improved survival, had more improved exercise capacity, had reduced rehospitalizations, and fewer revascularizations. This study shows that intensive lifestyle intervention through exercise was better to treat coronary artery disease than angioplasty and stents, thus affirming that lifestyle changes can improve, if not reverse, chronic metabolic disease. Next study by Greg asked the question, can you put diabetes into remission with intensive lifestyle intervention? He took 4,500 patients and put them into two groups, 
diabetes support and education, which, which is what we do nowadays. They're just counseling sessions three times a year uh, on diet, physical activity, and social support. Or the intensive lifestyle intervention group, they got counseling every week for six months, three times a month for six months, twice a month for three years, refresher courses at two and four months, a low-fat diet, a low-calorie diet, and a standard amount of exercise. At the end of the four-year study, they found that the intensive lifestyle group lost more weight, was better fit, had more partial and complete remissions, 11% versus 2% for diabetes support and education. This study shows that intensive lifestyle intervention was more effective than diabetes support and education to put diabetes mellitus in remission affirming that intensive lifestyle intervention can improve, if not reverse, chronic metabolic disease. Next study by Lean asked the question, can you use intensive lifestyle intervention to decrease weight, put diabetes into remission, and improve quality of life? They took overweight and obese diabetics, divided them into two groups. One was the standard group, which is just what they were doing in the community, and the other was a, life, a weight management group, which put them on a low calorie diet for five months, and then healthy food diet for eight weeks, and then the rest of the study. At the end of the study, the weight management group, 24% lost more than 30 pounds, none in the control group. Weight management group had 46% of their diabetics, almost 50% go into remission, and only 4% in the control group, and the weight management group had better quality of life improvement, quality of life improvements. This study shows that intensive lifestyle intervention was more effective than standard of care to lose weight, put diabetes in remission, and improve the quality of life, affirming that intensive lifestyle intervention can improve, if not reverse, chronic metabolic disease. The last studies are by Phillips, the legendary Adventist health studies. There's two of them. The first one was in 1974, the other was in 2001. They asked the question, is there any benefit to a vegan diet and healthy behavior? Well, in the Adventist health study one, they found that those on the vegan diet, they lived longer, had less cancer, had less stroke and heart attack, and they weighed a whole bunch less by 30 pounds. In 2001, they looked at chronic metabolic diseases, what we've been talking about. They found that the intensive lifestyle intervention through a vegan diet and healthy behavior reduced all the prevalences of those diseases, affirming that intensive lifestyle intervention can improve, if not reverse, chronic metabolic disease. At the Metabolic Weight Management and Lifestyle Center, we take a patient-centered approach using intensive lifestyle intervention using to, uh, to wellness using the eight points of light program. Um, we, we make nutritional recommendations based on their metabolic derangements, physical fitness recommendations based on their capabilities and disabilities. We assess for mood disorders, disordered eating, binge eating disorder, addictive eating patterns, and treat those, because that always is a barrier to getting success. We look at their pharmacotherapy and get them off insulin-provoking medications and on medications that are not so insulin-provoking. We try to treat physical and emotional stress because anybody who's stressed is always going to gain weight because of this mechanism here, high insulin and high weight. We assess their sleep hygiene, making sure they have their insomnia treated and they don't have sleep apnea. We help patients prepare for bariatric surgery, take care of them after bariatric surgery. We help patients lose weight for their elective surgery for joint replacements. Their colostomy reversals, their gallbladder surgeries, and we always recommend faith engagement because that puts the patient in a better, healthy position. At the Metabolic Weight Management Life Center, Center, we assess each individual's weight and metabolic derangement through a thorough metabolic history, physical, and detailed food journal analysis and behavioral questionnaire. We measure their metabolic rate, we calculate, we measure their, their body composition and their metabolic lab work, and then design a personalized program using the eight points of light principles. We divide all whole carbohydrates into 10 different levels and give them a booklet on that. Lowest rung, lowest carb, highest rung, highest carb, and this better informs the patient of their nutritional decisions. This booklet also provides guidance on reduction of saturated fatty acids if they have an intolerance to cholesterol. So we talked about the basic science on how metabolic syndrome, obesity, and chronic metabolic diseases, they're all related, and it's caused by refined processed carbohydrates, starchy sugars, and artificial sweeteners. We talked about the clinical science, showing that intensive lifestyle in, uh, intervention has some chance of reversing all that problem. Now, here's an actual case example, a clinical application in a real-life patient in our clinic. He's a 50, whoop, whoop, 
Uh, okay, where am I going here? Uh, he's a 54-year-old 54 54-year-old male with diabetes, type 2, hyperlipidemia, hypertension. Those are chronic metabolic diseases. He has ulcerative colitis and spondyloarthropathy, which is an autoimmune disease, and he, it was poorly controlled at four to five bowel movements a day. He had chronic low back pain. He could not exercise. He has sleep apnea on CPAP. This was his medication regimen. He was on 220 units of insulin per day. Now, Dr. Nelson and, and Dr. O'Dell probably know that that's kind of a lot of insulin. And uh, that only got him to a hemoglobin A1C of 7.3. He was also on metformin. His starting weight was 243, and he had a lofty goal weight of 175. This was his nutritional pattern when he came to our clinic. You can see the protein in the green, carbohydrates, starches, and sugars in the red. This is a relatively low protein, high processed carbohydrate diet. This is the standard American diet. That's what everybody comes into our clinic with. Starch, starch, some starch, sugar, starch, starch, starch and sugar, starch, starch, sugar, sugar, starch, starch and sugar, artificial sweeteners, starch and sugar. This is an insulin provoking diet. That's why he's 243 pounds. That's why he needs 220 units of insulin just to control his blood sugar a little bit. Through a patient physician shared decision making process, we decided on this type of diet going forward. Protein in the green, whole high fiber carbohydrates in the black. Now, he wasn't eating all this protein in, in one day, but this is the types of proteins he was eating. And I would say this is an animal based protein diet, but whole high fiber carbs, only water. He, but the amount of protein was only four ounces two to three times a day. That's the size of the palm of your hand. That's not that much. But it was more protein than he was taking in when he came in. Okay? Here's the light bulb moment. Within one month, he was off his insulin, off his metformin. He had lowered his blood pressure medicine and lowered his prednisone use for his ulcerative colitis and spondyloarthropathy. Here's the lab data. He started with a hemoglobin A1C of 7.3 with all that insulin. Six months later, 5.5. Nine months later, 5.6. On no insulin, no metformin. Diabetes in remission. That's a good thing. High insulin, high weight. Low insulin, low weight. His insulin went down because I removed what? Refined processed carbohydrates, starches, sugars, and artificial sweeteners. That's the only food I removed. And I replaced it with whole high fiber carbs. Now he has a normal insulin level. And that's how he was able to lose the weight that he lost. He had diabetic nephropathy, which means his kidneys were leaking protein, which eventually will go on to develop kidney insufficiency and renal failure. At six months, it resolved. That's a good thing. His good cholesterol was low, which increases the cardiovascular risk. By nine months, it was in the normal range. That's a good thing. Now, this is going to be interesting to you, some of you, especially my doctor friends. His, his, his cholesterol, his bad cholesterol off of Lipitor at the beginning of the program was about 190. And I measured again off of cholesterol medication at 137. His bad cholesterol went down when he's on a higher protein fat diet than he was when he came in. Why is that? I'm not going to, that's a rhetorical question. Metabolic syndrome produces lipoproteins that contain bad cholesterol in it. When I fix the metabolic syndrome, I remove some of that bad cholesterol from the body, and that's why it dropped 52 points. Now, that's not in the normal range yet. I'm sure that's a saturated fatty acid problem. Back on Lipitor, he is 70. The reason why you do that is because since he went on a higher protein diet, I did not know if that increased saturated fatty acid was going to blow up his cholesterol. I had to follow that. But it did not. He improved, but not cured yet. His BMI was 39 down to 27. His weight was 243 down to 168. He beat his goal weight. What? Clinical case summary. His starting weight was 243 down to 168. He lost 75 pounds of weight. That's 31% of his body weight. He's off his insulin, off his metformin, diabetes in remission, hyperinsulinemia resolved, diabetic nephropathy reversed. He's only having one bowel movement a day now for his ulcerative colitis on lower prednisone. He's off his CPAP. His sleep apnea is resolved. That's a physical force-related illness that we talked about at the beginning. His hypertension, his dyslipidemia is improved with normal HDLs. LDLs are improved. He's still on some Lipitor. Hypertension improved, lower dose of Losartan. Reduced doses of prednisone, 15 down to 5 milligrams. All the improvement was a result of nutritional changes only. Removing the toxic nutrition of refined carbohydrates, starchy sugars, and artificial sweeteners, and replacing it with whole high-fiber carbs. He could not exercise 
at all. He did not take any medications for weight reduction. But what do we do with his current weight? It's still too high. It's in the overweight range. What do we do? He's still on blood pressure medicine. And what do we do? He's still, on bad, he's still got bad cholesterol. So through a patient-physician shared decision-making process, we offered him these alternatives. Replacing animal proteins with vegan proteins and leaving everything else the same. What would that do? <clears throat> vegan proteins, less salt. That can help lower his blood pressure medicine further. Less calories in vegan proteins than animal proteins. So he could lose more weight, which could improve his cholesterol and his weight. And less saturated fatty acid exposure, which means he could lower his bad cholesterol further. But alas, this was a bridge too far for him. And we, he didn't think he could sustain that, so he stayed with what he was doing, but the seed has been planted. We try to have our patients eat more like this. Lots of water, lots of vegetables, low-sugared fruit, pick your protein uh, of, of choice, whether it be lentils and legumes or whether it be your animal protein, and be careful with the starchy products. There's too many slides there's too many diets to put on one slide. So I only put the best and the worst. The point I want to make is that any diet other than this is, a, is an improvement for a patient. So no matter, no matter how little the patient chooses to move the needle, anything is better than this. And you've done a good job. You can't fix everybody completely. Most of our patients end up around here in a Mediterranean diet without bread. The point I want to make though is, um, is you, you need to figure out a nutritional pattern that reverses their metabolic derangement that a patient can sustain. Now, I've had many conversations with Dr. Kana and Dr. Nelson about nutrition and always valued them. I always told them that my patients may not be vegan, but they're more vegan than they when they began the program. I'll say that. Back to Hippocrates. He believed that disease was not a punishment from the gods, but rather a consequence of environmental factors, diet, and living habits, lifestyle. How the heck does he know that? 2,500 years ago, and no, everybody outside of this room doesn't. People in this room know it now. How does he know that? If he were here today, he'd be wondering, why is everybody throwing pills at treating chronic metabolic disease when all you need is lifestyle changes? Nutrition, physical fitness, and remove the toxic nutrition. So how would Hippocrates treat chronic metabolic disease in the 21st century? Probably the same way he did 2,500 years ago. Let thy food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. If we could give every individual the right amount of nourishment and exercise, not too little, not too much, we would have found the safest way to health. Not too long ago, our society looked like that. 60 years ago. Today we look like this. And if we're not careful, we're going to look like this. That is the end of the presentation, and I'll be happy to answer any questions, or if your minds are blown with so much science, we can just call it a night. Okay, because it's hard. But again, as a, as a patient, if you don't understand your disease and what's causing your illness, you can't treat it. And that's what we've been doing for 35 years in treating me in medicine, internal medicine and pediatrics. We've been giving you the pill saying this is your treatment, not identifying the cause. I believe... You guys in the, in the Adventist health system, in the, in the good food nutrition, you got it right. But how do you convey that to the entire world population that is suffering? Okay? You got to get the food. And it's, it's a lot harder to do than you think because food is addictive. And they always, and you're in an environment that is very hostile, filled with carbohydrates, starches, and sugars, and there's lots of enabling going on. And you're an island, you're swimming upstream and you're always on the verge of failure. But the more you can have your community around you, your family that's eating well, you can stay on the program. But this is the science. And I'm an internal medicine wonk. Okay? I don't like to just guess. I love the science. I love the cause and effect. And none of this was known when I was in medical school, residency, or the 20 years I practiced medicine before getting back into it. You guys knew it just because of your... Be of, of I don't know, just lifestyle. You guys always lived it. But the, there's, the, there's the science behind it, why it works. Stick to the food in its original form. Thank you. Okay. okay. 
I'm sorry that it was, took too long, but uh, I, there's no way you can, you can do it any other way. You gotta... I wonder how you were going to get by with saying so much, I and mean, then you really did. So if you have any specific questions, come and, and talk to him. I think some want to go. And... Jody, you can ask your question. Yeah, how? I mean, to list them off. Well, just the, just what I showed you. Just the. Um, here, yeah, yeah. That's all. <laughs> it's your glasses. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me.